and it's been another week. This week I thought we would do something really fun. It's the five significant movie tag by Mikola, who had been tagged by John D. Barker, and I watched both of their five significant films. The thing is, it's five movies that were significant to you personally, and why. It now isn't like a list of favorites. Instead is about like, at what point you found them in your life, and why they were significant to you. I define a lot of myself by what I am creating. These five movies had a huge impact on the way I view movies, on the way I view storytelling, and on the way that I construct my stories. And so this is the five movies that were significant to me when I saw them and why. Movie number one, Back to the Future Part Two, 1989. I was nine years old, and this is the movie when I saw it in the theater that I finally realized that I wanted to be involved in the making of films. Because at nine, I was finally old enough to realize, okay, I'm never gonna get to travel through time, I'm never gonna get to ride on a hoverboard, I'm especially never gonna get to ride on a hoverboard being pushed by a car through a tunnel and then flip over it while grabbing a comic book in order to save the day. The only way to do it is to make movies. Let's figure out how to make this magic happen for us. Nine years old, I remember the feeling in the theater just being in, just in awe of it. And I tried to find out everything I could about Robert Zemeckis and especially the invention of the hoverboard. And in a TV special he said it was real and I'll never forgive him. And I was nine years old, Robert Zemeckis. I believed in that hoverboard, man. I immediately, within a couple weeks, went about and made my first movie. The family had a, you know, home video camera, one of the ones with the little tapes that go in the bigger tapes so you could watch it in your VCR. And it was genius. It was called Into the Future. And it was the exact plot of Back to the Future 2. And you had to really, you had to have seen Back to the Future 2 to be able to understand what was happening in Into the Future. Because at one point the couch was a time machine and then my little remote control DeLorean was the time machine for the wide shots and everything and it was just a mess. But, it was the first movie that got me involved in movie making. Second movie on the list, saw it when I was 15 years old in 1995, the film Desperado. Another sequel, it's actually, this, so the first two movies on this list are part twos. Desperado is the sequel to a movie called El Mariachi, made by Robert Rodriguez, about a lone gunslinger who kind of has a guitar case full of guns and he goes around uh, these Mexican towns like killing drug dealers. That's what he does, he does it with a lot of panache and a captivating editing style. Now the reason Desperado was so important to me was A, because I thought it was super cool. I was really into the whole 90s gunfight thing. And the gunfights in Desperado were insane because they were all cuts, they were all editing cuts. Robert Rodriguez, his early, early stuff was cut like crazy. You could still discern what was happening, but it was like processes, mini processes within his cutting. And that, like, I thought that was the coolest thing ever. But it also led me to his book, Rebel Without a Crew, which I read at 16 years old when I was living in Austin, Texas. And I loved Rebel Without a Crew so much that I thought I should drop out of high school and go make movies. I didn't do that. I finished high school. Rebel Without a Crew is, is Robert Rodriguez's journal from the time he decided to make El Mariachi, signed up to do, have medical experiments done on him, got seven grand for that, <laughs> and made a movie with seven grand. And then his whole thing about go, taking it to Hollywood, going to Sundance, and on and on. Rebel Without a Crew lit a fire in me to do it yourself. Go make your movie and do it yourself and get it done. And he also taught me the write what you have access to thing. You know, Rebel Without a Crew was huge for me. And that's why Desperado was huge for me. Number three on my list is another movie from 1995. I saw it on VHS in my bedroom, again, living in Austin, Texas. 15 years old, 16 years old. These are intense personal revolutions are taking place inside yourself. And you're starting to look for your own things. And this had a huge development on my filmmaking. Again, I was working at a video store, I was working at a Blockbuster video, but Blockbuster was too mainstream for my 16 year old self, but there was a video store across the street that I would go rent movies at after working at Blockbuster called Hastings. On a weeknight you could rent like a VHS movie for like 50 cents, 56 cents or something like that. You could have it for a day and that was genius because I was broke as hell. Uh, I was going through the shelves looking for something, you know, underground. Black and white movie case looking at me just this wide-eyed Johnny Depp staring at me with paint on his face. A movie called Dead Man. I watched it in either 96 or 97, rented it. Opened my eyes to this counterculture film movement. Uh, this director named Jim Jarmusch. He came up in the 80s, and his movies are still. His movies are still. Characters actually watched TV in his movies. They would sit there and they would watch TV. Not in Dead Man, it was a western. I put in Dead Man, and there's this train going. It's all shot in black and white. And the weirdest Crispin Glover 
of all time, played Barney McFly's dad, shows up and gives the weirdest speech ever, and then Johnny Depp shows up in the weirdest western town ever, unlike any old west I'd ever seen. I hadn't seen a lot of westerns, but this one was like gritty and weird, but also poetic in that Jim Jarmusch kind of way, and the cinematography was lovely, the soundtrack was meandering, mostly just Neil Young tooling around in a guitar, and there were these long sections where you would just watch Johnny Depp ride a horse through the forest. Native American showed up, and he was hilarious. And then Billy Bob Thornton and Iggy Pop showed up out of nowhere around a campfire to try and kill. I mean, it was just the weirdest jumping off into an area of film that I had no prior experience with. It led me to other Jarmusch flicks like Stranger Than Paradise and Down By Law is my favorite of his still. Mystery Train was amazing. It was that time where I kind of did realize that movies didn't have to be this three-act thing that everyone, you know, that the industry gave you. There was this weird independent film thing going on. So I started seeing all these indie movies as much as I go to foreign films everything. And I thought I was super cool and super Indie. Officially released in 1999, didn't make it to screens until the year 2000, right beginning of the year 2000, so I was 19 years old when I saw in the movie theater a movie called Magnolia, Paul Thomas Anderson film. I saw it in the theater, and I was so mesmerized the entire time. Magnolia is, is an ensemble film, it follows a bunch of different characters whose stories touch each other, either tangentially or circumstantially, and they all are, are trying to make sense of what their life has become and kind of come to terms with their past and what it means for their present, and they're all making bad decisions. The opening sequence of Magnolia is so good that it got me thinking in terms of film sequences. The opening of it is all about the theme of coincidence and these little mini stories that seem like they're larger than coincidence. So it's playing with coincidence versus fate, all this stuff, but the timing and the storytelling and the camera work and the editing and everything of that opening sequence, right up until the title card, like they do this build and then, and then Amy Mann's version of the song, One is the Loneliest Number, comes in and that moment it's, it's giving me chills right now, just remembering seeing that for the first time in a movie theater. The beginning of that movie is amazing. All of the performances are amazing, and the stories are so intensely personal that, again, it was like kind of a counter-mainstream thing. But Magnolia was so good that my friend Liz drove me to the theater, and we watched it, and then we were driving away from the theater, and I asked her to pull over the car. I, people laugh at me when I tell them this, justifiably so. I asked her to pull the car over because I was having a panic attack because Magnolia was so good. This is true. Like, I had to get out of the Jeep. Like, I had to go, like, sit on the curb. Like, my chest was tight. I was so, like, I could never do anything as good as Magnolia. And so, like, I just had this panic attack. Yeah, and the end of that movie, too, just rocks my world. And people are like, this is nonsense. And I'm like, this means everything. You know, and then I read everything about Paul Thomas Anderson. And I had seen his other movies, too. Like, I saw Boogie Nights, and I was like, okay, whatever, it's fine. I liked Heart 8 more than I liked Boogie Nights. And then Magnolia was just... It was like a revelation to me, and I started writing all these ensemble pieces and started trying to focus more on character and sequences. Character and sequences. Not only was it effective, but it was cool. And meaningful. To me, at least. Uh, Magnolia. And this last one, number five, was released in 2003. Uh, but my involvement in it started in early 2002. Old School. I auditioned for Old School at an open call at USC and when I was living in LA. I got through to the first callback by having a little bit of a banter with the director Todd Phillips. I didn't give a good performance, but he liked the banter that followed it, so he gave me a callback. I was one of the four non-speaking pledges that belonged to the old school frat house. We were the college kids, and none of us had any lines. My buddy Patrick, who's now second lead on Suits, I met him first day, my first day on old school was his first day on old school, and he had a line in an outtake, <laughs> um, but it never made it into the movie. It was so exciting to be inside the studio system and to be like on sets and to be watching how they were making the movie. It was so similar to the way that we make movies, just with better equipment and more time and more money. You discuss the thing, you shoot the thing, you move on to the next thing. You discuss the thing, you shoot the thing, you move on to the next thing. And I saw that that was how it was at no matter what stage of the game you are, that's how it works. That's how we do it here. That's how I did it when I was 10 years old, making Into the Future. I was on that movie for two months, and every day was 
the greatest day ever. I was on a movie set, which is where I always wanted to be, and I was around people who were doing it, and they they were just normal people. I had long hair. Uh, here's a picture. I know I've said this before. That's me. In, a, in an outtake, in a deleted scene from old school. That's five significant films for me that helped shape the way that I see movies and see my work. Yeah, so I'm sorry these are so long. These updates are so long. And I am getting some good headway on Pops. I've made it through a really difficult effects sequence. And I'm waiting to get some stuff back from Ryan, too. And I'm looking forward to seeing that. I would love to see five significant films for you. So if you do a five significant films thing, do a video and leave in the comments a link to your video because I want to watch it. I want to know your five significant films. Check out Mikola's, they're great, and check out John D as well. His stuff is good too. Films you wouldn't expect to be like significant films in people's lives just are. That's the Pops logo. I'm going to keep working on Pops. Thank you so much. I hope you have a good week, and I will too. Bye.